the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So I'm excited to be here and uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for making me feel at home with this weather because I'm sure you guys prayed to make me feel at home. But I want to tell you something. The reality is Canada has much better weather than this. This is not, this is not Canada for sure. But at the end of the day, we're, we're thankful for everything that God, God brings us. Um, so I want to start off by saying God works with me in a very direct manner. So a lot of times when, uh, when I need to work on something in my life, uh, God will ask, and I was saying this to Joe and Sandy yesterday, God will ask me to kind of prepare a topic or sermon. So there's a lot of things that I need to work on in my life, and this is definitely one of them. So I'm not going to stand up here and uh, express that I have a perfect family and that... Uh, that you know, I know everything to know about families. There's people here that have been married much longer than I have. So I look forward to the discussion por portion of this. Uh, but at the end of the day, I know that God is trying to speak to me directly in a way that I, there are certain things in my family that I need to change. And what I felt was, is that we all know that relationships are extremely important. Like whether it's relationships as a family relationship, a husband and wife, parents to their children, you with your colleagues at work, Relationships are important and they're a big part of our life. So uh, what I felt that was on my heart was is that what about like how do we take relationships and how do we bring them back to a simplistic you know, point of view. We were, the topics that were given to me were more like uh, you know, Orthodox family in the modern era, era. But the reality is, is we need to go back in order for us to be like the families that God are calling us to be. Uh, and really the title that I gave the first talk is, is called Fighting for an Awesome Family. And the second part will be a little bit more discussion later on this afternoon. It will be about a strong family. So what are the traits that we need uh, you know, for an awesome family? And purposely I chose the word fighting. Fighting for an awesome family. Because awesome families, normally if we don't fight for anything, like it's, we're average. You know, like if you don't do anything to your family, it's going to be average. But we need to fight for, for a good family. And if we look at uh, back in the day of Nehemiah, what, this is one of the verses that it says, Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your house. We need to fight. And there's so many things that I could express right now that is attacking the family as, as we know in, in our societies right now. Yesterday we were speaking to the youth and we are talking about uh, you know, how the values of society of you know, the country here in America, also in Canada, we're not, uh, like our values are declining and there are surveys out there that are saying that 10 years ago we had, uh, we held value or we had more moral values than we do today. And unfortunately we kind of disguised and we spoke yesterday with the youth group about tolerance and how we kind of changed the definition of tolerance, meaning that everything is acceptable uh, and everything is equal and everything, all the values are right and that there's kind of no more truth. What, what is true for you is not necessarily true for me and we went through that and there's so many things that are out in the society that are attacking our youth but at the same time that are attacking our family and we need to be able to fight back and I don't want to sit here and dwell on the negative because uh, I rather not dwell on the negative I rather focus on uh, you know the positive and we're gonna talk about four different traits that families or awesome families need to have these are gonna be very simplistic very simplistic, but I think there's things that we might be missing in our families uh, nowadays. I know that for myself, uh, I do miss, uh, miss out on it. And the word fighting means that we shouldn't give up. A lot of times it's much easier for us to give up and that we want to give up on our families because, you know, uh, you know, we don't see the benefit of fighting for it. Or we're just like, you know what, I might as well just give up on my wife because she doesn't understand me and so forth. So we take the easy way out and that's it. And we separate and we move our own ways. And that is not what we're called to do as Christians. That's not what we're called to do. It's the easier way. And that's what we spoke about yesterday a little bit, that people value more uh, things that are convenient and th things that are practical versus truth. And this is what we do sometimes in our families too, is that why is the rate of divorce so high in our societies? Because it's easier 
to be single. Let's, let's face it. Like, it's easier to be single than to, than to be married. Why? Because I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and nobody tells me anything. I get to eat what I want. If I want to eat cereal in front of the TV, then I'm going to do, I'm going to eat cereal in front of the TV. If I want to eat a cookie in my bed, I don't care about the crumbs. That's my problem. It's not my wife's problem. You know? But, not that I have that problem. <laughs> we, I love cookies, and I saw you guys have cookies. Anyways, that's beside the point. So, the reality is, is that we need to fight. And just a word of encouragement is that it's never too late to fight. I have friends that unfortunately, their, their marriages ended very quickly after four or five years and ended. Why? Because they just gave up. Because they think it's too late. It's, I made the wrong choice of spouse. Or I made, you know, a wrong decision so God is punishing me. Or whatever it is that they have in their mind. But the reality is, is that we, it's never too late. It's never too late for God to do something in our families and to make our families awesome. And families are the backbone of society, are the backbone of, of here. Why do we call churches a family? Like, I, I love the fact that you address your church as a, uh, as a family, not as a community. Or, well, a community is fine, but uh, as an organization. A lot of times that's what we think. But family is so much more intimate. And that's what I pray, no matter how large you guys are going to get in the future, that you always stay a family, that you always stay, stay close. So no matter what, it's never too late. So the first trait that I want to mention is that awesome families are playful. Okay, awesome families are playful. That we think sometimes our families are dysfunctional, but we put the fun. We got to put the fun in, in our families. And unfortunately, we don't focus on this anymore. We focus on when a church speaks about what a family needs to do, it doesn't talk about being playful. It doesn't talk about, it talks about, well, you got to have a rule of prayer. And that's fine. I'm not dismissing that. But you can't forget one without the other. And our families need to learn to go back and play. When you ask your child right now, what is it? If I take any of the kids that are here, if I take them aside and say, what is their favorite thing to do? Like, um, what fun things do you like to do with your family? Let me ask Joseph. Joseph, what's the fun thing that you like to do with your family? Um, play board games. Play board games. Grace. Grace. What is it? Read books. Read books. Okay. Sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, uh, Joanna. Joanna. What about you? Yeah, perfect. Did you notice something? Those are three, three, three children here. I guarantee you, bring me a hundred children here. And not one of them is going to say, I'd like to play a video game with them. Not one of them is going to say, like, I, I don't like spending time with them. The, the reality is, a board game is so important. Why? Because it gets to spend time. You get to spend time. We just like, kids like to be with, our fam like with their families. This is what the kids are saying. Like, this is, I didn't, make, I didn't prep them. This is what they said. I should have prepped them, but this is perfect. Like they, they answered perfectly because that is the truth. And that's why this verse on, on the screen is so important. As surely I say to you, unless you convert and become like a little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Our families need to look and become like children. We need to see things in the eyes of, a chi of children. And there's, there's this thing in society that we have to become overcomplicated and so forth. We need to be simple. We need to be simple when it comes to our families. And one of the things is, is that we need to, to have uh, you know, a playful time together in our family. Because a lot of times, if you're thinking about it, if you have children, then I could tell you I have three children. And I run into the mistake that all three of them want to play hockey and all three of them want to be a part of soccer and all three of them want to be uh, in swimming and all and we start to just fill the schedule and our discussions around the dinner table and that's if we have dinner together our discussions around the dinner table is how do we plan our schedule and that's our discussion with our children is we got to do this and we got to do this there's no time for us to kind of just sit and relax and be uh, with one another children are telling us, spend time. You don't have children, this is equally important. 
You know, one of the fav my wife's favorite thing to do is to walk in the mall with Starbucks in her hand and that I'm walking with her. She doesn't care about the shopping, believe it or not. She doesn't care about the shopping. She just cares that I have him confined in this box that he can't go anywhere and he's with me. And that's the time. It's not about the children, it was about our time spent together. And a lot of times you find that we don't have that time anymore. Uh, I'm in the process of moving houses and I, I spend very little time in Ottawa, in my Ottawa home. And when we're there, I have to admit, all we are doing is preparing the house for sale, and this and that and whatever. And it's a very hard time in my, in my relationship with my wife right now. Why? Because I don't have time to spend with her. We, don't, we are not making time to play. We're not making time to just go out and have coffee and, and, and enjoy each other's presence. The Bible says a lot about, you know, the worker is worthy of his wage and you got to do and you got to have discipline and you got to do. But it also talks about enjoying life. The wisest person in the Bible is King Solomon. And King Solomon in Ecclesiastes will say, enjoy life. I commend the enjoyment of life. I commend the enjoyment of life. Are you enjoying life? Are you sitting back and you look at your husband or your wife or your children and say, yeah, I'm enjoying life with them. I'm playing with them. Go ahead. And if Abuna Michael was here, he would coach all of us to watch the NBA playoffs. Because I did trains and that's the only time sometimes I can sit and do something nothing. That's okay. And that's okay. I'm not, gonna, I'm not uh, going against Abuna Michael. He's my father. So, like, I, I, I agree. Like, there is a time that, yeah, you could watch a game together. It's, it's not harmful. That's what I'm saying. A lot of times we may feel guilty because we're sitting just doing nothing, watching TV, you know, with our wives or this, when we should be doing a billion other things, uh, cleaning, laundry, this and that. No, what's more important is sit and watch TV. And I, I try and drill this through my wife's head, but sometimes she like, no, things need to get done. And that's women versus men. Like women have, you know, I have a billion things on my mind and they could think of they can multitask, we can't, fine, you're the superior race, but I, I'm just saying like, we can't, uh, we can't multitask, you can, but at, at a certain point, there's a point that we need to just kind of like shut down and just say, we are together. You had something more? I was just going to say, since some of us are married, some of us are single, so I think even in the idea of like family, you know, our friendships have evolved as well. So even if we are not, you know, committed in a, uh, a relationship with marriage, I think the, I, even the, the, the family within friendship, that's, that intimacy within friendship has changed because of social media too. So uh, sometimes people replace the time that they're texting or communicating as meaningful time that they're not just sitting to meet up, you know, like you said, for Starbucks or something. Yeah, 100%. And that's why I like when Joe said, like, this day, your day-to-day -day spiritual day, will involve a lot of fellowship time. Like, I think they, there's a, like an hour and a half for lunch. Joe and Sandy were telling me yesterday, like, there's an hour and a half. There's a purpose for that. It's not because you guys are going to eat a lot. It's not like, I'm sure the food is great, but it's, it's for us to get together and to, to enjoy some time. So, uh, and actually, they didn't know about this, this first point, so I'm glad that they put it in the, the schedule that there is a lot of time for fellowship. And you know this. We know that preschoolers, if we look at preschoolers, like when they're playing, technically they're working, they're developing. Um, I don't know if you guys seen on Netflix, there's a, there's a documentary called Where to Invade Next. It's Michael Moore. He, uh, he basically goes to different countries and he takes the best thing out of the country and he says maybe the United States should invade this country for their education or for their prison or their whatever it is. So one of them was education. I can't remember if it was Finland. It was somewhere in that area. Finland, Switzerland. I don't even know if they're in the same area. Anyways, <laughs> I'm very bad with... It, anyways, it was in that area. Uh, and basically they said they have the best education system. And what, what it was, was is that kids had a lot more time at school to play. Kids 
also design their own playgrounds. Every year they would change the playground, they would get the input of the children, and then they would design the playground. Why? Because they know that it's so important for the children to have time to be children and to play, and that's where they develop. So there, there's something to say about, uh, about enjoying life and being playful. In 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says, I'll paraphrase it, it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives richly all things to enjoy. Gives all things to enjoy. I.e. just saying party. Like this is what, what St. Paul is saying, is that like you should party every once in a while. God has given you everything to party. You're allowed to enjoy uh, everything that God has created. So there's a time, and then in families, there's obviously there's a time for spontaneous fun, and there's a time for planned fun. I think we don't plan enough. We plan sometimes like the the planned fun, but the spontaneous fun is something that we we don't we don't do. Like if you have children, will you decide one Friday that you know it's not it's the Friday before a long weekend to surprise them in the morning and well I'm not gonna say. That. <laughs> Close your, not take them to school, for instance, you know, <laughs> like, you know, tell them, you're, we're not going to school, we're going to a trampoline park. We're doing this, like, as a treat to your children. When was the last time that you and your spouse just woke up in the morning and said, we're playing hockey, we're not going to work, we're going to go and do something just for ourselves. When was the last time you did that? The, the reality is, is we get so focused on what we need, like, what we think we need to do, that we are forgetting what is essential to do for us to have awesome families. They say that people will, won't remember what you've done for them, but they'll remember a lot more how you made them feel. How are you making your family feel? How are you making your spouse feel? How are you making your children feel? Am I enjoying my children day in and day out? Or am I just, my family is a boot camp. I got to make sure that my children are in bed by a certain time. I got to make sure that my husband has taken out the garbage on Tuesdays. I got to remind them of all these things. Is my house a boot camp? Or is my house more a playground? A playful area for, for our family. Should we not? Uh, am I... Are you got, am I never coming back here again? <laughs> Is this what's happening? <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You guys want to... Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you guys to get... Don't get me wrong. Don't get all fired. And like, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, there's wisdom in all of this uh, at the end of the day. You know, uh, I heard a couple once say, we can't afford to spend time because of the kids or we can't like to spend time together because of our kids I don't know who has kids here who doesn't but uh, that is one of the biggest mistakes when we feel guilty that we the husband and wife are doing something for themselves uh, and they don't want to do it because of the kids you need to make time for yourselves husbands and wives and families need to make time for themselves it's a serious mistake when we say we're not going away we're not going on a date night because the kids or, or this and that. I love my children to death. I love them to death. But at a certain point, uh, I'm not doing them any favors when I am not giving my wife any, uh, any love and any encouragement and, and the time that she needs. We want, you know, the best gift that I could give my kids is that I show them that how I love my wife. Because once they see that I love my wife, they, they are learning a lot more uh, in the background. It is much more precious to them than all the money in the world that I'm going to bring them. It's much more precious than the house that I'm going to bring them or the games that I'm going to give them or the iPads or whatever. I guarantee you, if I ask my children, do you want an iPad or do you want me to spend five minutes with you? Guaranteed they're going to tell me five minutes. Guaranteed. Even though my kids love electronics. But I guarantee you, that's what they're going to say. Would you want to see mommy and daddy arguing? Or do you want like 
you know, uh, an iPad. They're going to see, no, obviously, uh, not arguing, sorry, no. They don't want to see us arguing. <laughs> they want to see us resolving arguments properly. This is what they want to see. The way you spell love is T-I-M-E. This is what it is. Ask anyone. I, I told you about my wife. My wife, her favorite thing to do is walk in a mall with a Starbucks coffee in her hands and I'm, I'm beside her. This is what she likes to do. She doesn't ask for much. She doesn't care about the flowers. She doesn't care. Uh, I'm not saying don't get flowers. Flowers are good. Chocolate are good. Don't worry, girls. Like, I got your son. <laughs> don't worry. We'll still get, you'll still get your chocolates. But I'm saying at the same time, it's not good enough just to give stuff. You need to give your time. And we need to become more uh, playful, playful uh, families. And this is trait number one for an awesome family is that they make time to have fun together, that they play together. And like the kids told us, or the children told us here, they told us, I like it when I play board games. I like it when, uh, you know, we, we go places. It's about spending time together. It's not about, you didn't hear one of these children out here say, it's, it's nothing about the parents giving me. It wasn't about anything that the parents were giving other than their time. So number one is, awesome families are playful. Any comments up to now on the trait number one? Or any experiences? Well, I think one of the things that uh, are very helpful for parents is that uh, they, they're the ones that give the kids a sense of humor. It's very important to show your kids that you don't take yourself that seriously. You know, you're willing to laugh at yourself and things that happen to you that day and stuff like that. But also, you know, like, um, they need to know what things well, of course, it's cultural to a certain extent, but they you know things that are, are really funny and things that uh, you feel really don't have any humor in them mm -hmm. that should be taken seriously. So it just basically gives them a compass, uh, basically on playfulness and uh, laughing and joking and stuff like that, but kind of cross the line with jokes that can be hurtful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, I think Sandy. Also just uh, re reflecting back on my single book. Um, the times when I thought like, my personality was just great and maybe hopefully that really attracted my, my prospective spouse is when I was playful and fun and I was just being myself and not like taking myself too seriously. So like, I think even our, us meeting each other was around fun and leisure, not more so like a serious date or a serious event. Yeah. You know, it's not about how like smart or intelligent you are necessarily, but maybe how your personality shines forth. Exactly. Yeah. Fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, just to go off that, I, so I totally think that because I feel like being playful kind of builds trust. Like if you can be silly with someone, you can also be serious with them. Like if you have, it builds a foundation of the relationship. Like if you can be playful, then at that moment when it needs to be serious or you have to get serious, you have that like foundation already built, that trust that you can say like, oh, I can trust this person with this important thing that I need to say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Someone else had something. I, I was just going to add that, um, I think to your point, when I, it is really important for the husband and wife to spend time together. Um, and I, it, sometimes it's, um, and it's wonderful that you've identified what works really well for your wife, but I, I think at times just the day is so busy. Um, and even in the evening, um, it's what we try to do with my daughter is it's like, okay, it's mom and dad time now. But we can actually decompress, have a cup of tea, and just talk about the day and kind of prepare our minds for the next day. And sometimes it involves a little watching TV. Otherwise, it's just sitting down and just kind of decompressing and kind of letting out what's on your mind, what's on your chest, and not and, and avoiding that build from day to day and then it really builds up towards the end of the week so I'll just I'm just sharing what works for me mm -hmm. um, and my Absolutely. Is just really spending 30 minutes at the end of the night just talking about the day the conversation who said what how did, I, how did our daughter have to react to this you know sometimes she says things to both of us one of us won't say anything with the other one and let the other one say something and you know just kind of analyze the situation but it really does give us that time in the moment, at that, at the end of the day, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's worked really, really well versus building it up and it just kind of festers in your mind. It could be a comment your spouse said that really 
irritated you, but you couldn't say too much because your children were there. But it kind of allows you when you can just have that focus time versus waiting for that date night. So just you know, it's just kind of like nuggets throughout the the evening if you can. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Actually, we did a, a parenting course uh, about a year ago in our church, so we were attending it. And one of the things they came up with was like this work, uh, this worksheet, uh, and it was it just said ten minutes a day. That's basically what it was, and it said you need to schedule uh, as much as you can uh, with your children ten minutes a day individually. So if you have three children, that's thirty minutes a day or throughout the week. Um, I'll be honest, we did it once, like Amir and myself, like we s split up the kids and like I did 10 minutes with one, she did with the other and then we, uh, I did it with the other. And it was just, they get to pick whatever they want. It was, pick whatever you want to do. You have 10 minutes, I'm going to be yours, my phone's going to be away, you can pick whatever you want to do minus no electronics. So two of my sons picked, uh, let's play hockey together. So I played hockey with them for 10 minutes. You put a timer on uh, and so forth. So you set their expectations because you also can't go on forever. But, you know, as much as they were disappointed when the 10 minutes were up, uh, I'm telling you, I did, we did it once, once. Uh, and this is months ago. And my children still speak about it till this day. They still speak, ab and that was 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Like, can you imagine if I was able to give them 10, like, a dedicated 10 minutes a day that you choose whatever you want to do, whether you want to go for a walk, whether you want to read a book together, whether you want to play a board game, but it's 10 minutes. It makes the world of a difference. And I, I feel like, like what you're saying is almost like we got to also shift that to like our spouses. Like we do that for the children, but we need to also do that for our spouses. Maybe not 10 minutes, but like a, li a little bit longer, but it's, it's definitely worth Planning, and that's why I said there's like a, a spontaneous fun aspect, but there's also a planned, uh, a planned aspect to it. Fighting for awesome families is important. St. John uh, uh, of Kronstadt said, where there is no struggle, there is no virtue. Where there's no struggle, there's no virtue. We got to fight. We got to fight. There's going to be a struggle for us to have uh, awesome families. The, se the second trait that it, for awesome families is... Awesome families encourage growth. We create an atmosphere of like developing. We like to do that for our children and we do that for our, our spouses, but we were much better at that during the like dating phase or the engagement phase. We were very good at, or at least I was, very good in terms of encouraging my wife to be. Uh, like in everything that she would do, everything she, that she would do would be like the end of the world and it would be great and whatever and now I find and I confess like I find it extremely hard for me that when she does do something right to to give her a good word to give her a word of encouragement to um, to make her understand that I understand what you're going through wow it's amazing that you're taking care of three children and the house is spick and span like it's hard for me to say that because honestly Deep down inside, maybe I, I say, well, that's, well that's, uh, that's the least she could do. Like, it's almost like that's what I'm saying in my head. And we need to go back to our dating phase. It's like, you know, like Beyonce, like once you put a ring on it, like it's, that's it. Like something is, something's gone. Something is gone when it comes to encouragement. Encouragement is out of the door once, once we switch that ring over to the left side. And we need to be able to bring that back into our families if we want to be uh, awesome families. Awesome families, why encourage growth? Because awesome families never stop growing. A mother never stops growing. A father never stops growing. And children never should stop growing. Because once you stop growing, you're, you get in a rut. Like you become, like there's no more interest to develop new things. And your family becomes boring. And it reflects back on your playfulness. So we need to learn to encourage. Look, what, uh, look at the verse on the screen. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and men. These are the areas that we need to continually grow. Like he grew in wisdom. That's intellectually. We need to continue to grow intellectually. Sometimes we feel like, okay, that's it. I studied. I, got, I have a PhD. I, I'm, I'm not going to... 
learn anymore. No, we need to continue to learn. We need, whether it's within your field, whether it's a different field, we need to continue to learn like a mental growth needs to continue. As children need to continue to grow mentally, we, we are the same. We need to grow mentally. There are new areas, there are new challenges that we are faced day in and day out in our societies that we need to learn about and how, how, how we're going to deal with them. So grow mentally. Grow in stature, that's physically. At some point, yes, okay, you stop growing physically. But you need to stay healthy. You know, we try all these new diets, or we, we, we work out, we do all these things. This is important. This is not an aspect of our life that we need to ignore. A lot of times we think that the physical part of our body is not uh, important. We just focus on the spiritual. That's not true. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to actually be intellectual, to be healthy, and to be spiritual. And that's why at the end you see that he grew also in favor with God and with men. So spiritually is obviously with God, and then grow in favor with, with men is socially, like on a level of social. Again, these don't contradict each other, but for some reason we have it in our heads that we can't be social and spiritual, or we can't be, you know, uh, a health freak and be spiritual. Why? Those are all intertwined. Those are all things that we need to, uh, to do. We need to encourage growth. There are certain things that if you don't learn in your family, in life, you're, you're going to struggle with it uh, in the future. What have you learned from your family? Like, what do we want our children to say that they learned from our families? Like, I could try this again with the children, I don't know. Joseph, what did you learn from your family? If there's one thing that you could say that you're learning from your family, what is it? Playing basketball, okay. So healthy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stretch as much as I can here. <laughs> Grace, what have you learned from your family? What is it? Prank. Okay, prank. Thank God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's always risky when you're there, but you know, you you trust that God is gonna take you. <laughs> So, but, but that is amazing. But honestly, but look, look what our children are learning. What are we teaching? What are we teaching our spouse? Like at the same time, there's a bit of us that, well, no, I shouldn't teach my spouse. No, you should teach your spouse. You should encourage your spouse to get to a certain spiritual level. Uh, my spouse should encourage me to continue. There's a lot of times that I'm speaking to my wife. My wife's name is Amira. So if I throw the name Amira, there's a lot of times that Amira will kind of like get me on the phone and I would be, she'd say like follow up with this person or whatever and I'd be like, no, like I tried and like this person almost doesn't deserve it and, she, and then she'd like kind of like reel me back and start like, uh, hello, <laughs> like what's your role? Like what are you doing? Like that's not what we're, we're meant to be and she, she brings me back, she, she grounds me and she tells me. This is time for you to, to like step up and re, like, and she pushes me to a different level. The same way that, you know, I will push her to a, a certain limit and so forth. So, what is your family teaching? What are we encouraging our kids to learn? One of the things is, um, we have to remember that the way that a spouse, like a husband and wife deal with each other, need to deal, yes, obviously in love, but you can't forget the other portion of that, which is humility. Like, I need to be willing to learn from my, my wife. I can't be the one sitting there and say, I know better. Or I'm the man of the house. I'm the one that they put the robe on during the wedding. So I'm the priest of the house. I'm the one that's going to be responsible spiritually. No, because there's a time in my life that I'm going to be down. And I'm going, I need her to help me to, to be up. And we need to be able to humble ourselves when we do that. One of the church fathers says, the fastest way to heaven is through two things, love and humility. We, we know what to do, love. Love, we could love our community, we could love God, we know how to do that. Humility is one of those things that we kind of tend to forget every, every once in a while. Or we don't really know how to do it. We think that it's us becoming a doormat and people need to step all over us. And it's us letting people go for communion first. This is humility, but that's not what it is. What it is, is about us surrendering and understanding that I am not able to do things without you, God. That's why confession is really important in the Orthodox Church. Why do we have it? People don't like it. People don't like saying, well, wait a second. 
Why am I going to a priest who's a human and I have to tell him my sins? Why do I need to do that? Because a big portion of it, if not the whole portion of it, is about humility. It's about me being able to humble myself and go to my spiritual father in front and say, hey, I'm not perfect and I need help and I'm surrendering in front of God and in front of another human being, I need help. So it's important for us to learn the, the virtue of humility. Uh, you know, one of the things is we need to also learn on the humility side is how to pray like Hollywood style. Like Hollywood style, like when you look at a movie, when you're watching a movie, how do people pray? People pray, they go to their bed and they get on their knees. When was the last time that you prayed on your knees? Why get on your knees? Because getting on your knees is a, is a form of surrender. If I come and I kneel in front of you, it's, it could be worship, but at the same time, it's surrender. It's important for us to go home and to be able to pray on our knees and to say, God, I'm surrendering everything to you. And this is one of the ways that we will learn to continually accept encouragement and teachings from others, but at the same time uh, become, uh, become an encouraging person. Everybody needs a Barnabas in their life. A Barnabas is the son of encouragement. That's what his name means. Barnabas is the story in the Bible where St. Paul and Barnabas uh, got into an argument. Why? Because St. Paul didn't want to take Mark anymore. Because Mark bailed on them on a previous trip. So he didn't want to take them. He's like, no, no, no. He's not coming back with us. And Barnabas was there to encourage Mark. When Mark was down, Barnabas didn't kick him. I'm not saying that St. Paul was wrong. I'm just saying St. Paul is tough love. This was like encouragement. Sometimes it's good for tough love and sometimes we need encouragement. We need a Barnabas in our life. Everybody needs a Barnabas in our life and you need to be a Barnabas to someone. And that, who better than your spouse to be a Barnabas? What are, what are the things that we learn in families that will, uh, that will help us in the future? And how do we need to encourage people is one of the things is that we need to create an atmosphere to learn, to learn how to deal with feelings. Where else are you going to learn to deal with feelings or to name feelings uh, or to express feelings correctly rather incorrectly? Because it's in your safe zone in your home. You should be able to express your feelings to your spouse very easily. And when your kids see that you could express feelings, guess what? Your kids, your children are also going to learn to start to express feelings. One of the worst things that I do, and I confess this to you guys, is when my daughter starts crying and I tell her stop crying. What in the world am I doing? Like what am I doing? What, like she's crying obviously for a reason. Like she's expressing an emotion, a feeling, and I tell her stop crying. Like as if that makes a difference. Like she's gonna stop crying all of a sudden because I said the words stop crying. What am I doing? I'm suppressing her feelings. That is totally wrong. That is really ignorant of me. And one of the things we need to teach is how to deal with, uh, with emotions and how to express emotions and also how to respect feelings. Because that is one of the things, like when, when I argue, uh, a lot of times I go on the attack and like I don't respect the person's feelings in front. I was just speaking to one person that's in a, in a relationship and uh, it's when they argue, they, they become nasty. Like they become just nasty to each other. You don't deserve love and you don't do it and all of this stuff, like words that you wouldn't say to your enemy. And all of a sudden you're saying to somebody that you supposedly love, that's not how we deal with feelings. We need to learn to respect each other's feelings. Yes? A, um, a very, probably most of you guys know this pastor on TV, Charles Stanley. Mm -hmm. he, he's a very nice uh, speaker, good Protestant uh, pastor. And um, he, he wrote a beautiful book on um, being in touch, basically being, I can't remember the book, but being in touch with yourself. And I remember being so impressed with that. It was quite a few years ago. Uh, and um, he, want, by being in touch with your feelings, he wanted you to eliminate the physical causes of distress from the very beginning, because those are the ones you could really address. You know, sometimes emotional uh, distress is bringing out physical problems. And he said to never let yourself get too tired. Never let yourself get too hungry, and never let yourself get too lonely. 
And a lot of us, a lot of us are people in leadership positions. And probably the loneliest position in the world is the position of a person in leadership. Because they don't get all the emotional support and feedback. They're the ones that are always giving in, in their jobs. When they come home, that's when you have a nice talk with your wife or your husband, right? Especially um, knowing that he's going to be really hungry when he walks in that door. And he's going to be really tired when he walks in that door. And you've got some bad news to deliver. We you can make sure that he sits down and has supper and uh, relaxes and laughs and everything at supper time before you deliver the bad news. Because, <laughs> like, like the electric bill <laughs> was out of sight this month or something like that. So, um, uh, and uh, he, um, I thought that was very, very insightful because um, I work with the sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, by working with the sick, you can, you can see how much their fear, their pain is, is contributing to what you see in that person lying there in that bed. So um, I thought I would just pass that on. Amazing. I thought that was very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Amazing. Any other c comments on that? I'm going, I'm going to get there. That's the next one, actually. <laughs> so the second thing that we learn in families, and for us to become awesome families, is that we need to learn to deal with conflicts. We need to learn to deal with conflicts. The reality is, is our, if you have children, your children are going to look at how you deal with conflicts with your, your, your spouse. Like, am I a skunk or am I a turtle? And most of the times, you fall into one or the other. A skunk is a person when you're in conflict, you want everybody to know you're in conflict, and you stink up the whole place, and you yell, and you do whatever you want. You make sure that everybody in the house knows that that person has wronged me, no matter what. And that's what we do. Or you become a turtle, and a turtle retracts into their shell, and they don't say anything, they become mute, uh, they become a martyr, like they just kind of like stay quiet. It's one or the other. <laughs> a lot of times actually you're married to a skunk or to a turtle and in some situations you're the skunk and you're the turtle and vice versa. Like it switches all the time. But the reality is, is, is that our children and how to deal with conflict are learning from us. If I cannot control my temper when I'm speaking to my wife because she just got under my skin and all I want to do is for her to understand my point, my child, my son is going to do the same exact same thing. Not only to his future spouse, but to uh, any maybe any female that's in his life. That's how daddy speaks to females. So that's what I'm learning. When he's upset, he has the right to speak this way. That's what I'm teaching my children when I'm not dealing with conflict in the, in the right way. So families should encourage growth and in a way for us to, uh, to learn uh, to deal with conflict. The third thing is what do we value most? What do we value most? A lot of times if you are not uh, being playful with your family, if you're not spending time and having meaningful conversations with your family, they are getting what matters most by an outside source. And it's not an internal and an eternal source. It, they're getting it from outside. Where are they getting it from? From nowadays, it's YouTube. Like my son, like we used to watch TV. So TV was fine and you didn't have control over like what was on TV. And like you couldn't see like anything really bad unless it was past like midnight. Now it's like free for all, anytime. Uh, you don't really control, even cartoons kind of, like, cartoons are good. Like, if you look at Family Guy, Family Guy is not a cartoon for kids. But yet, some parents are oblivious to this, and they, oh, it's a cartoon, so it must be fine, and they let their kids watch Family Guy, which is horrible. <laughs> like, you, you shouldn't let your kids watch Family Guy. But at the end of the day is, what are we teaching our kids? Are we having the time to teach our kids what, what's, uh, what, matters, what matters most? So, for instance, like, I don't always have to be first. The world doesn't teach that. Your families should be teaching that. You should install that in your kids. It's okay to open a door for somebody else. It's, it's nice to be respectful to others. It's nice to uh, accept others, uh, but not necessarily, uh, necessarily agree with everything that they're doing. 
These are families. This is, this is where we come in and we need to teach our children. If not, they're going to get it from YouTube. They're going to get it from movies. They're going to get it. My son, we were walking in Toys R Us, uh, which is closing down in the US, but still up strong in Canada because it's a <laughs> Canadian company, so I'm just saying. We're walking, and then he's like, Daddy. He's like, you see that guy? So it's a normal guy. He's a big guy, but a guy, and he has a video camera. I'm like, yeah, I see him. He's like, he's a YouTuber. I'm like, a YouTuber? I'm like, I don't even know what, like, I knew what a YouTuber was, but I'm like, how do you even recognize a YouTuber? He's like, can I go up to him? I'm like, you want to go up to, like, for him, it's like a movie star. He's taking this as a movie, he's a movie star. And I was like, go up to him, like, you want to go say hi, go say hi, like, that's fine. So he goes up, he comes back, and he's like, okay, let's take a picture together. And he takes a picture with this YouTuber. So then I'm like, I ask him, I'm like, what's his name? So Matteo tells me, he tells me his name is Wolfie. I don't know if you guys heard of Wolfie. You hear Wolfie? So like, Wolfie has 7.7 .7 million subscribers on YouTube. Like, this is, you can't, you can't even, con what I'm trying to get to is that you can't even control that anymore. Because you think that, for instance, this guy is going and all he's doing is uh, reviewing one of the toys or whatever. But later on in the YouTube, like, there's either like a, a word that's not appropriate or a way, something that's not appropriate. But it's teaching the kids so much, uh, uh, like, a different life. Like, my wife, the kids were watching one of the YouTube and sh we stopped YouTube for them for, for a very long time. Why? Because one of the kids said, Mommy, why aren't you as fun as that, that mother on TV? She doesn't cook. She doesn't clean. She's not doing laundry. All she does is spend time with her kids and have fun or whatever. Why don't you do that or whatever? It took them to a different reality. The reality is they only saw that, that mother on her good days. Like That's what they put on YouTube. They're not going to put a mother that's yelling at their children. And my wife was like, this is abnormal. Like Now they are comparing her to a YouTuber as opposed to like what what real life is what is the most important things in life so where are they gonna l learn their value about like sex where are they gonna learn their value about family life what about us like where are we learning our our like how to deal with our spouses are we learning this from the world or are we learning this from from within us and and having that communication so it's important for us to learn what matters most Last is about good habits. Uh, I won't go too much through the good habits. You guys understand, like one of the things that Grace said was, is that what do you learn from your parents? She's like, oh, we learn to pray. Great. Good habits could be as simple as uh, let's pray in a restaurant. I know for me, like I was extremely uncomfortable uh, praying in a restaurant. Like it wasn't like my thing. It's I, I, like I do the sign of the cross, kind of like hiding or whatever. But why, why, am I, why am I doing that? Like, what am I teaching my spouse? Or, like, why are we encouraging each other to, to share our faith and get into the, to the good habits? Pray before eating. Being thankful. Like, when was the last time that you and your, your spouse stood up in the morning and just were thankful for life? Thankful for, the, for your house. Thankful for your family. Thankful for that you have each other. When was the last time? Thankfulness. Why we always start every Orthodox a ceremony with the, uh, the prayer of thanksgiving is because the prayer of thanksgiving is a miracle worker. You have a conflict, I guarantee you, pray the prayer of thanksgiving and your conflict will start to, to dissipate. I, and I'm talking out of experience. I had a family member that we stopped speaking for three months and it, the issue was, I wasn't even in the house when the issue happened. And they stopped speaking to me for three months. And I was like, and I kind of like, I was like, what in the world? Like, why? Like, I wasn't even here. <laughs> like, it's not my fault. I'm not going to call this person or, or whatever. And then I realized that I wasn't, for the three months, I wasn't thankful for anything. And then I started, uh, like, I had a habit of just praying the prayer of Thanksgiving in the morning. And I promise you guys, the day that I started praying that again, like, lines of communication started to open again. Uh, and ever since then, I'm a big advocate for the prayer of thanksgiving that it is a miracle, a miracle worker. If you don't have this habit with your spouse, whether it's, but it's always to be thankful for everything that you have, I would, I would encourage you and your families to, to do that. Other things, obviously good habits, you guys could speak about them, you know, being honest, all these things, not twisting, 
uh, saying the truth, even if it's going to be harmful for you. These are all good habits that we need to, to teach our kids. How do we do this? How do we do this? Through two ways. I'll give you two ways of what to do and what not to do. What to do is through example. Christ, what did he do? He went and he washed the disciples' feet and he said, I am your teacher and I humble my, like I'm washing your feet and I'm asking you to do the same. So through example. So our, you know, children will understand through how I speak to my wife. When I'm arguing, they know that we argue. That's fine. I have no problem uh, that the children understand that couples are going to argue. I have no problem with that. I have a problem with how I deal with it. And if I deal with it very negatively, then my children will also uh, start to deal with things negatively. Uh, so through example, and we take that example from, 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 from Christ. He washed the disciples' feet. We need to learn to wash each, other, each other's feet. The other is through conversation. Through conversation. Unfortunately, like I said at the beginning, a lot of our conversations in our families are to speak about like our to-do list. And it's not meaningful conversation. It's not conversations that steer up some emotions and some feelings. It's about like what I need to do. Did you take out the garbage? Uh, what about, you know, uh, Grace's swim, uh, swim lesson, Mateo's hockey, this and that. And we just sit there and we plan our schedule and that's the whole conversation that I have between me and my significant other. Where is the time for us to actually have significant conversation to actually start to install what is, what is most? Like if I, in Deuteronomy 6, 7, it says, again paraphrase, you must teach God's commandments. It's not an option. You must teach God's commandments and then it goes through the Ten Commandments. When do we ever teach? Like if I ask my children what are the Ten Commandments, I don't know if they could spit them out. I don't know if I asked you guys here if we could spit them out. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, like I have to look them up. Like, I don't know them off by heart. Uh, so, how are we teaching something that we don't know? When do we have that chance to actually teach what we're supposed to? Why are we leaving all the spiritual aspect of the world, uh, all the spiritual aspect of my life to the church? The church is there. It's great. And you guys have a great community. And hopefully like the community is going to be something so vibrant that you could have it every single day of your life. But the reality is we were speaking yesterday like it's different times now. Like churches are a half hour away or 45 minutes away. You can't go to church every single day. You can't be a part of that community every single day. So what are you supposed to do? Because was this the model that God wanted when they first installed the first church ever? I don't think so. I don't think that they said, well, come on Sundays and we're good uh, and you'll, you'll be fine spiritually. I really don't think that's what he, he intended for the church. He intended for us to be the living church, our families to be the living church. When was the, ch when was the last time that you and your spouse opened the Bible together? When was the last time that you had a meaningful conversation, whether you have children or not, like how will we raise our children or how should we raise our children? When, when do we have those, um, those, those conversations? We need to take, uh, you know, time to teach our children and to teach our spouses and to, to spend time together to learn more uh, on the spiritual aspect. We can't just leave it to the church. You can't. That's not, it's not enough. This is the most important part of your life. And yet, on Sunday morning, sometimes we decide that, guess what? My son has a soccer practice or a hockey practice. And I'm going to teach him that it's okay to miss church for soccer. This, we may not be doing it every week. We may be doing it once a month. And it sucks because I have a son in hockey. And, uh, and I have to tell him. I have to tell him every once in a while. I tell him. Uh, if it conflicts with church, you're not going. And he's okay with that. Except, like, but I broke that rule once. And guess what? When I broke that, 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 that understanding, now it's much easier for him to come back and say, oh, well, church is not as important, or God is not as important as my parents make it out to be. So we got to be careful because the decisions that we make, that we think may not be harmful, 
are extremely harmful uh, in the future. What not to do? What not to do is pretty obvious, I think, I hope. But unfortunately, it, they're obvious, but they're also very easy to do. So helping through criticism. Uh, for some reason, we love to judge and criticize our spouse. Again, when we put that ring from this side to this side, it's like the floodgates open that now I can criticize you about everything, how you brush your hair, how you brush your teeth, how you close the door, how you don't close the door, uh, uh, put the seat down, don't put the seat down, whatever it is. Like there, I can criticize you about everything at this point because now I have you locked in. This is what we think. And that is a horrible way. Can you imagine that I go to my children and all I do is constantly t criticize them about what they do and never give them an uplifting word. It's the complete opposite of encouraging. Complete opposite of encouraging is criticizing. Like if you go, I don't know, the sport here is what? Baseball is one of the most, okay. The, the pitching, uh, the pitcher. Can you imagine he's having a bad pitch? And you know how sometimes the manager kind of walks up and like he says something that he's probably not saying anything. He's telling him I had cereal for lunch. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying. But can you imagine that he goes up to, to the pitcher, star pitcher, and says, don't throw a curveball. Don't throw a curveball. Don't throw a curveball and walks away. 